This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's uh, Tuesday. We're so happy to be with Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski here on Community Matters. The title of our show is My Heart is in Jerusalem, and indeed it is. Isn't it for all of us somehow? Yes, indeed. Especially this time of the year when on the Jewish calendar we celebrate Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is, uh, <clears throat> is the festival that commemorates uh, an event that happened in Jerusalem. Yeah. So, how appropriate. Uh, can you tell us uh, the origins that of Hanukkah? Yeah. Yeah, Hanukkah is the, is the holiday that commemorates the uh, victory of a small group of Jewish, Jewish army. They were called the Maccabees. And they stood up against the mighty Assyrian army in about 165 BC during the time of the Second Temple period in Jerusalem, when the uh, uh, Syrians prohibited the Jews to practice Judaism freely, to uh, express their, their beliefs freely, and, uh, and prohibited and forbade Jewish practice. And uh, the small group of Jewish uh, warriors uh, led a battle against the Syrians and they were victorious in the battle against all odds like we've seen in our lifetime in Israel the six-day war mm -hmm. and um, and when they um, ch chased the Assyrians out they uh, rededicated the temple the holy temple in Jerusalem which was defiled by the Greeks and one of the services of the temple is to light the menorah. They had a candelabra that was lit every day. And it was uh, an oil menorah. It was the, the, the lights burnt by oil. And the Greeks um, defiled uh, all the oil. And they, own, they only had enough for it to burn for one night. Uh, and it would require eight days for them to replenish it with the... Uh, uh, renewed oil, pure oil, uh, and the miracle of Hanukkah is that the, uh, the, the, the candle, the oil that was enough to last for one night miraculously burnt for eight nights until they were able to replenish it with oil. So this is what we celebrate on Hanukkah. It's a very joyous holiday, and um, so how appropriate it is that today we're talking about Jerusalem. Yes, yes, and let's talk about Jerusalem too and the temple. Uh, where, you know, the Wailing Wall is located. There's a courtyard there. Right above the temple is the, is the um, uh, what is it called? It's the Temple Mount, uh, the Dome of the Rock, I think. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us about the history of Jerusalem? I know we only have half an hour for this. <laughs> okay, so briefly, um, the first Jewish king from the Davidic line was King David. And King David uh, chose as his capital, uh, Jerusalem, and, uh, and planned to build a temple for God. Um, but because, um, as the prophet told him, that his hands were uh, soiled uh, from so many battles, it would be his son Solomon, King Solomon, who... Uh, who uh, replaced uh, King David, that he would build a temple. So King Solomon built the, what we know as the first temple, and that in Jerusalem, in the capital of Judea, of, the, of, the, of uh, Israel, and uh, that lasted for about uh, 500 years until the Babylonians uh, came and uh, exiled, expelled, destroyed the temple and exiled the Jews to Babylon. And, uh, and then 70 years later, the Jews came back. Uh, at that time, uh, Persia uh, was the uh, power. And King Cyrus gave the Jews the green light to go back and to start rebuilding the temple. And this was the second temple that they built, which stood for another 500 years 
about until the Romans uh, came and destroyed the temple and exiled the Jews from Israel. It's getting to be a habit. <laughs> <laughs> and all throughout the over 2,000 years since that happened, uh, is, uh, Jerusalem always remained as the, uh, the center of prayers for, for Jewish people. As a matter of fact, the Jewish custom and tradition is that we always pray towards east, towards Jerusalem, uh, wherever one may be, whether in Hawaii. Actually, in Hawaii, technically, we should be praying west because <laughs> we're closer to Israel, okay. west. <laughs> But um, everywhere in the world, Jews pray towards Jerusalem, and part of our prayers is expressing our yearning to come back to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem has always been, um, you know, at the, at the center of, of all our prayers, and more so uh, even throughout the, the long exile when the majority of Jews were living outside of Israel, there always was a presence of Jews in Israel, and they were always the majority mm. Uh, mm. in Israel throughout the 2,000 years. What, what does the word Jerusalem mean in Hebrew? I remember Yerushalayim, it's right. all through the prayer books forever right. and ever, right. but what does it mean? Yerushalayim means, uh, in Hebrew, Yira means fear, fear of God. Sholem means like shalom, peace. Mm -hmm. uh, in Hebrew, shalom also means perfect. So it's the most perfect place uh, to uh, feel the awe and the presence ah, of God. Ah, that makes it a spiritual center for sure. It's a spiritual center, yeah. and also shalom is peace. It is, the, uh, it is the yearning for peace, which has always been the Jewish way, even though that somehow, uh, uh, you know, many people don't see it that way, or the narrative has been, has been turned against the Jews. Yeah. So now in Israel the, today, uh, there are two major cities, Tel Aviv, you could say three if you include Haifa, um, the Tel Aviv and Haifa, and then Jerusalem. Right. Um, what respective roles do they play? How does Jerusalem differ from, say, Tel Aviv? Well, firstly, Tel Aviv is a very cosmopolitan place. Uh, Jerusalem is more ancient. Uh, Tel Aviv is the, is the center for commerce and... Um, and culture in Israel. Uh, but Jerusalem, besides for it being a holy place and a lot more you know, all the religious, um, you know, the, the, the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, etc. But also Jerusalem today is a very vibrant city. Ever since 1967, when the Israeli government recaptured Jerusalem from the Jordanians, who waged an offensive war against Israel in 1967. I remember. And uh, the, the Jews were victorious in that battle, and we reunited Jerusalem because from 1948, when, uh, when Israel was established, uh, the Jordanians fought the Israelis, and they, and they captured eastern Jerusalem. They destroyed uh, all the Jewish, first of all, they expelled all the Jews from East Jerusalem, they destroyed all the Jewish synagogues and temples, as well as even Jewish cemeteries. Destroyed all of that, and uh, Jerusalem was a divided city. And in 1967, uh, when Israel was victorious against uh, its Arab uh, foes, um, it uh, recaptured eastern Jerusalem, reunited the city, made it a city which is free, everyone is free to worship God, in their way, the Muslims are, are free to worship in the mosques, and the Christians are free to worship in the churches, and the Jews are free to worship in the synagogues. And besides for it being a religiously a, a place of tolerance for all nations of the world, literally uh, fulfilling the, prop, the biblical uh, prophecy of the prophets of old when they said that Jerusalem will be a home for all people, uh, it is also um, a very, very uh, um, business-wise, high-tech-wise, it's becoming a, a major center um, in Israel, mm. in, all, in all fields of endeavor. And the main airport, uh, Lod Airport, that's right between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem? Yeah, it's actually serves both cities? It's actually closer to Tel Aviv. It's right on pretty much Tel Aviv. 
It's probably about an hour, an hour and a half to drive from there up to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So what, um, help me on this. I have understood that the U.S. Um, has offices, and the Israeli government, for that matter, has its offices and its, uh, its, its basic... Um, it's basis governmental establishment in Jerusalem rather than Tel Aviv, am I right? Correct, right. And this is the, um, this is how preposterous this whole, you know, this whole phenomena is. There is no country in the world that doesn't decide where its capital should be. And uh, it's no one else's business, really. Yeah. You know, we don't say to Jordan, you cannot have Amman as your capital. We don't say to... France, that Paris is not your capital, or et cetera, et cetera. Each country decides uh, where its capital is going to be. Fair. And Israel is no, is no different than any other country, especially, as we just mentioned before, the, the rich history of Jews dating back 3,000 years, uh, a little over 3,000 years, where it was the, the capital of Jerusalem. Um, so Israel, the, when Israel was declared a uh, state, it, it uh, declared Jerusalem as its capital. But because the world couldn't swallow that, that was too much, um, it never acknowledged Israel as, I mean, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Mm. So by our president, President Trump, uh, making uh, the declaration and the announcement, that, that which he promised uh, early on in his presidency, that he would uh, recognize Jerusalem as a capital, that which all four or five presidents before him have always campaigned on, he was going to do. And that's what he did. And it was, I think it was very important because, as he said, he's just acknowledging a reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also by right, Israel has the right to choose its capital. Yeah. And so it is the reality, as far as Israel is concerned, that Jerusalem is the capital of the country. Correct. And traditionally, you put embassies from foreign countries in the capital of the country, Correct. such as all the embassies in, in this country in Washington, because right. that's where it goes. Yeah. Uh, so, and he 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 made this promise early in his presidency. Uh, I believe on his camp in his campaign. Campaign, yes. Yeah. He's, so he's he's following through on that. Correct. But why now? I mean, did somebody have his ear about this? Is somebody asking him? Um, was there any particular event in the world that made him want to do this now? In what, December of 2017? I don't know, to be honest with you. I know it's something that uh, uh, the Jewish people have been lobbying for a long, long time, uh, as well as our friends on the Christian uh, right have been lobbying for what is just and right. It's true. A lot of Christian people see Jerusalem as the center of, of Israel, yes. uh, and they visit all yes. the time, and they do that for many reasons, but including religious reasons as the place for the birth of Christ, no? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I think Trump is just going down his list and, uh, and, and doing what uh, he said he would do. You know? yeah. Now he's working on the tax bill. <laughs> <laughs> tax bill, Jerusalem. We're going to take a short break. Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski of Chabad of Hawaii, uh, today on Community Matters, we're talking about my heart. My heart is in Jerusalem. We'll be right back to talk about the effects of this announcement. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Hi guys, it's RB Kelly. I'm your host of Out of the Comfort Zone, where I find cool people with cool solutions to problems that all of us face. Now, the thing is, we're really cool, and I only invite really cool people, but the thing is, I think you're kind of cool too, so I think you should come and watch. That Thursdays at 11 a.m. here on OC16 Television with Think Tech Hawaii. I'm RB Kelly, host of Out of the Comfort Zone, and I will see you next Thursday. Okay, today's Tuesday, the 19th of December, here on Community Matters. We're talking with Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski, who is the rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii. 
Uh, and we're talking about, my heart is in Jerusalem. We're talking about the recent announcement by uh, President Trump uh, uh, making, at least recognizing from the United States point of view, that Jerusalem is, and the reality already is, uh, the capital and should be the place for the American embassy uh, in Israel. So, and, you know, this is, a, this is a move that he made which has implications, even though it's recognizing, really recognizing a reality and, and maybe something that should have happened a long time ago, actually. Um, but now there, are, there, there is this pushback. Um, so I guess my question is, um, you know, what does it mean, you know, in the diplomatic sense of it, what does it mean to put the embassy in Jerusalem? Well, you know, I'm a rabbi, I'm not a politician, so I don't know how well I can do diplomatically, explaining things diplomatically, but I, I believe the reason why it's very important and also the reason why it, we've seen such pushback, not only from the Arab world, but also from almost all countries except for a handful, um, that is because the, the larger question is Israel's right to exist in the land of Israel, not the capital. That's really uh, what's driving this whole uh. debate. It's the larger question, does Israel have a right to the land of Israel? The Arabs say no. They still today do not accept Israel's right, except for perhaps Egypt, but Israel's right to exist. And so therefore, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the Western world, their thinking is, Let's not rock the boat. You know, if you, uh, if you demand too much and you claim too much and you walk with your head tall, then it's going to anger, you know, it's going to anger a lot of people. And, um, meaning the Arabs. Meaning the Arabs, right. Uh, but Israel, and President Trump rightfully uh, agrees, in that Israel has a right to exist. It has a right to exist because Israel is our biblical homeland. It's interesting, by the way, talking about Jerusalem. In the Quran, there's not one mention of the city, uh, not one time is the city of Jerusalem mentioned in the Quran. Their holy place uh, is Mecca and Medina. When they pray on the Temple Mount, they pray towards Mecca and Medina, not towards uh, Jerusalem. They have never seen Jerusalem as their spiritual capital. Never. In the in in the uh, in the Old Testament in the Bible, Israel is mentioned close to six hundred. I'm sorry, Jerusalem is mentioned close to six hundred times in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, Israel is is a was promised to the Jewish people from the very first Jew Abraham. God promised him in a covenant. That this land will, uh, you know, will be the inheritance for your children. And that's written in the Bible. That's written in the Bible, the Old Testament, right? Yeah. Written in the Old Testament. And even if you don't, if you're not, even if you're not a believer, even though that that uh, that millions and hundreds of millions of people believe in the Bible as God's word, but even if you don't want to go t uh, to that, Israel. Um, uh, in 1948, they recognized and established, uh, you know, modern-day Israel, the state, uh, it, which was immediately uh, um, uh, the, re the reaction of the Arabs was to wage a war and to, and, to, and to literally try to destroy this fledging state, and they lost in 1948. And every country in the history of the world is established that the winner draws the borders. Sure. That's, that's how the human United, condition that's everywhere. That's the human condition from the beginnings of time. Yeah. So even if you don't, you know, even if you don't, uh, if you're not convinced from just what the Bible says, so forget the Bible, this is just the reality of how uh, nations are formed, that the victor is the one who uh, establishes his presence. And Israel never initiated the war. That's very important to remember. Israel never initiated a war. It always, beginning from 1948, in 1967, before that, in 54, I think it was, in 73, Israel was 73. always attacked. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um, you know, the pushback is, is really hard to understand, and uh, my own view is that it, re it reflects a kind of anti-Semitism 
It's not limited to anti-Zionism. Anti-Zionism is in many ways a pure example of anti-Semitism. And so the Arabs are always going to oppose the existence of Israel in general, just as you say. Uh, but given all of that, um, how will we see this pushback expressed? Uh, and I worry, you and I sat at this very table, I think it was like two years ago, and we talked about the violence that was happening on the very same streets of Jerusalem. Uh, people attacked at random uh, for no reason at all, ordinary citizens being attacked where they walked down the street. Really horrendous things were happening. We talked about that. Are we going to see that? Um, what's going to happen with the people who are involved in the pushback, the anti-Zionism, the anti-Jerusalemism, the anti-Semitism? What's going to happen, do you think? Well, first of all, thank God Israel uh, is a strong country today. And its military and, and uh, its police are, are, are very, very, very strong. And they thwart many, many, many daily attempts of terrorist uh, activities that they thwart. And uh, as a matter of fact, Israel is, uh, is a model for many nations in how to combat terrorism. And they're very good at it, yes. They are. Because, you know, the, I forget who is the one that said that when they came for the Jews, uh, I didn't care because I'm not Jewish. When they came for the homosexuals, I didn't care because I wasn't homosexual. And then by the time, you know, the list goes on and on, by the time they came to me, I was the only one left you know, <laughs> to defend for myself. When Israel uh, was the first country to be uh, affected by this the terrorism, 20 years now or more, and really uh, many people in the world uh, were almost, uh, almost unashamedly saying that Israel uh, is, is at fault. Because if we just acknowledged and gave the Arabs more land, if we gave them Gaza, then all, it'll all be good. Um, that hasn't worked. That not only hasn't worked, it only, uh, it only intensified the problem because they turned Gaza into like a launching pad for yeah, uh, terrorism. Yeah. So when, 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 when no one cared about what's happening to Israel, Israel is the only country that was being uh, affected by terrorism. But today... Uh, it's not Israel. It's every other country, including our country uh, here. You know, my beginning of 2011, um, surely Europe, surely the Middle East. Um, but thank God Israel is able to um, do its best to, uh, to um, restrain and to, uh, and to quash these terrorist efforts. And the reason why it's so important, uh, uh, President Trump's uh, announcement, declaration, is because the truly can never, ever, ever be peace unless uh, both sides acknowledge the reality. As long as the Arabs uh, deny the reality and refuse to acknowledge it, there'll never be peace. Israel will never accept, uh, Israel would not have a peace partner. So I think by gestures or declarations like that, Recognizing, recognizing the, reality. the reality, I think that's the only hope for peace, because peace will only come if both sides recognize the reality. Mm. Well, we may have to have a pay a price in terms of um, you know the violence that might break out here. It hasn't broken out in any significant way just yet, but that doesn't mean it won't break out later in some way. And um, I, I wonder. I mean, Chabad, you're obviously going to be able to speak for Chabad. What is Chabad's position? On, on Palestine, I'm sorry, Jerusalem uh, in Israel, on the president's uh, declaration and on, on the pushback? Well, you know, Chabad uh, has a Rebbe. A Rebbe in Hebrew is for a grand leader. It was Rabbi Schneerson, who was recognized as the world's greatest Jewish leader of our time. He passed away about a little over 20 years ago. The Rebbe was a very fierce, fierce advocate for strong Israel. The Rebbe argued that um, concessions, making concessions, uh, the, giving into the demands of territorial concessions uh, is wrong because not only does it not bring to peace, but on the, uh, on the contrary, just the opposite. Because uh, once they get, uh, once uh, Israel concedes here, the Arabs see this not as a gesture of wanting for peace, but as, as weakness on the part of Israel. So, if, you know, if we kill another hundred Jews, 
then we can maybe get them to their knees and, and they'll give us more. And this has been ever since they had the, um, the peace accords and um, what was the name of the, uh, the not the Y accords before the... Um, no matter. The, yeah, one of the big peace accords that everyone harkens back to as, as you know, that glorious achievement if you look, you'll see that the Intifada and all of the terrorist uh, uh, activities in Israel happened afterwards because the Arabs don't see it as for what it was, as Israel wanting peace so bad that it's ready to give up yeah. its territory. They saw that, okay, we can now, if we, if we kill some more Jews and we put more pressure, world pressure, then we can bring Israel down altogether. Yeah. Right, with the, the bottom line being, let's bring Israel down. That's the real purpose. We don't care about exactly. peace. We just want to and bring down. And they say down. that clearly. You know, it's not something that we, that we have to figure out. They say it clearly. Ask Hamas. Look yeah. into their yeah. charter. So if I, want to, if I want to help Israel at this point, um, American Jew, um, what do I do? How do I, how do I express myself? Aside from having a show with you, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> well, so first of all, because as a rabbi, First of all, we Jews are spiritually a one people, organically one spiritually. And when we are healthy spiritually on an individual level, that brings spiritual power to uh, our brethren in Israel. So that's the most important way we can help. Every time you do a mitzvah, it not only is that means a good deed. A good deed. It's not only is good for your soul. Uh, and for your life as an individual, it is good for the collective, for the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And that's really why the Jewish people have survived all throughout this, these uh, uh, pogroms and holocausts, etc. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a supernatural uh, phenomenon. Yeah. But also important is a lot of people... Uh, are just mis, uh, they're, they're just fed uh, misinformation about Israel being the occupier and Israel being apartheid and Israel being uh, the aggressor. These are all f uh, uh, plain, fragrant lies. These are just lies. And I think it's important to, to you know, when talking to people who are, you know, open-minded and just... Um, want to know the truth to be able you know to be able to uh, tell it the truth as it is yeah unapologetic really important and we want to do that here at think tech but let me ask you one more thing going forward you know um so the president says that he wants to recognize declares that he wants to recognize israel he is recognizing is uh, jerusalem as the capital of israel then the secretary of state rex tillerson says that he doesn't think this is going to happen right now. That it's going to happen in three years. It's going to take him three years uh, to actually move, you know, physically move the embassy of the United States from Tel Aviv, I guess is where it is now, to Jerusalem, where the president declared it would be. Um, what challenges do we have? Uh, what, what do you expect is going to happen here? Is this going to be a smooth road, or are there going to be obstacles and and um, you know things we have to do that we have to overcome in order to achieve this move of the, the physical embassy to Jerusalem. Well, I'm sure there are going to be obstacles, as I believe they just tried in the UN. They tried to uh, force a vote to uh, undeclare Jerusalem as the capital, and uh, the United States vetoed, vetoed it. I'm sure there'll be many, many more things like that on the diplomatic uh, uh, front as well as in many other ways. But I think that Israel has to stay the course, has to be strong as it is. And um, eventually uh, people will come to realize that this is a, a reality that, that, that they have to embrace and live with and hopefully even come to respect it and to, and to see it, uh, you know, see the righteousness of, uh, of it. And, uh, and then we can move on to the, you know, to the next stage, which hopefully is uh, peace in that mm -hmm. region. Yeah. So this declaration takes on all kinds of secondary meaning that it becomes iconic. It becomes central in the whole conversation, doesn't it? It does. It does. I just want to say one thing before we conclude that, sure. you know, 
Today is the last day of the festival of Hanukkah. Eight days. The, yeah, the eighth day of uh, tonight brings in the eighth day of Hanukkah. We light eight candles tonight. Hanuk the story of Hanukkah and the message of Hanukkah is really a universal message. And it is explained that the lighting of the menorah to bring light uh, at night where it's dark, in the larger sense, is our task in this world to bring light into the dark places. And the nature of things is that light dispels darkness. So uh, if we are lit and we shine, we dispel darkness. And darkness is many levels for everyone. It can be something else. But the whole festival of Hanukkah, the whole story of Hanukkah, is the triumph of light over darkness. And, and I'm sure one day it'll come to the Middle East as well. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski, the rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii here on Community Matters, talking about Jerusalem. My heart is in Jerusalem. Aloha. Thank you.